everyone, my name is Megan. I am the Programming Coordinator with the Heritage Alliance. The collection that you see in the exhibit at the McKinney Center actually comes from the Heritage Alliance, so these are our historic quilts on display. And part of my responsibilities uh, in my position is to take care of historic textiles, including these quilts. And a lot of people actually have historic quilts at home, but they have a lot of questions about how to care for them, right? How to wash them, how to store them. And so I'm gonna provide a little information today about how to take care of the historic quilts that you all have at home. So what are we talking about when we say historic quilts? Normally historic quilts refers to heirloom quilts or quilts that are 50 years uh, of age or older. Um, that definition is kind of up to interpretation about what makes a quilt historic, but if your quilt at home has any sort of significant age on it, you're going to want to take special precautions in cleaning and storing it. First and foremost, we can kind of review some of the materials that your historic quilt is probably made out of. Um, typically, older quilts are made out of linen, cotton, wool, and silk and the interior batting is typically cotton, wool, or polyester. In 1910, we see the first manufactured fiber, which is rayon, so that's gonna become a popular textile in quilting as well. So take a moment to analyze your quilt, see what it's made of, and get an understanding for uh, the materiality of it, right? So what is it composed of? How is it put together? And that's gonna determine your best cleaning and storage option. Some questions to ask yourself in advance. Will my fabrics uh, on my quilt bleed? Can they withstand agitation? How fragile are they? All of these are gonna be questions that you're going to wanna consider as you examine your quilt and its materials. The most important question to ask yourself is, how will I feel if my cleaning or storage method damages my quilt? Because you're gonna to wanna to err on the side of caution um, no matter what, that's your safest bet. So if you feel in any way that um, you're gonna be upset about the outcome of trying or experimenting with some of these methods, then go ahead and just play it safe and opt for the, uh, the most conservative approach. There's some preventative measures that you all can take uh, at home to protect your quilt from some daily uh, and low threshold threats, right? So keep your quilts out of places with extreme temperatures or conditions like basements or attics or garages. You're also gonna wanna keep your quilts in low light. You're gonna want to avoid um, environments that have pests in them. And then make sure that your quilts are stored at a, a reasonable temperature, ideally between 50 and 60 degrees. And also keep your eye on the humidity. You're gonna want about a 50% ratio. So all of these are um, things that you can control in your home environment to ensure your quilt safety. Okay. Remember, some things you absolutely do not want to do. Do not pick up a quilt by one end. It may stretch or tear the material and then you've damaged your quilt because of the way that the weight is dispersed. Don't hang your quilt. Um, I know that in movies it shows all of the quilts on the line um, or over a banister. Don't do it. It causes tension, some stretching, and some potential tearing. So those are some things to avoid. Always, with your historic quilts, avoid direct sunlight. Um, don't put them out in the sun to dry. That's kind of a myth that we want to avoid. And also, quilts should never go in either a washer or a dryer. That agitation and the extreme heat of the dryer is very damaging. So any cleaning method we're going to use is going to be by hand. So the fiber content, dyes, and materials, and the construction of each of your quilts is going to determine how you're gonna to wanna to clean and store it. All of this should be done on a case-by-case -case basis. What works for one quilt probably won't work for another. So just keep that in mind. The best approach always with historic quilts is to leave it as is. But if you can't do that for whatever reason, we're gonna go over a couple of cleaning options. Really, you have four major options that you can do uh, at home or as the owner of a historic quilt. The first one is a non-wash option, which we'll discuss in just a minute. The second is uh, a vacuum screen method. It's very popular, very effective, probably your best bet. The third is a um, seeking out professional help, right? So getting recommendations of professional conservators who are more skilled, have better resources, have better equipment to kind of handle the more extreme cases uh, of cleaning and maintenance. And then the wet clean. This is your absolute last option, um, but I am gonna explain how to do that safely in case you have a quilt that's kind of in dire need of that treatment. So those are gonna be the four wash clean options that we're gonna discuss today.
Option one for taking care of your historic quilt is going to be your non-wash approach. So basically you're going to air out your quilt and this is going to get a lot of the debris uh, shaken away from the quilt. It's going to kind of re-energize the fiber. So this is a good approach um, for regular maintenance especially. But what you're going to do is take a plastic sheet, put it on the floor inside or the ground outside in a shaded spot, put a clean white sheet on top of that, and then you're going to lay your quilt flat. Make sure that there are no folds or creases but just lay it out flat do not beat your quilt do not hang your quilt and avoid direct sunlight so basically a shaded area uh, a cooler area is great um, you can keep it out there for a couple hours but keep your eye on the materials and make sure that uh, the sun isn't causing fading or anything like that but this is a really good option for just um, regularly reviving your quilts so the second cleaning method called the all over clean is the one that I would recommend uh, for most historic quilts again this is at your discretion but it's one of the most popular cleaning techniques and it involves a vacuum and screen so what you're gonna do is lay your quilt out either on the floor completely flat or on a table make sure that there's a protective covering underneath either a clean white sheet or a plastic sheet and you're going to get a nylon window screen cut it uh, to a reasonable size probably 12 by 12 is fine um, and make sure that you actually line the edge of that screen with some form of masking or duct tape so that you don't see any scratches from the nylon. Next, you're gonna take your vacuum cleaner and you're using the hose for this. So you're going to uh, put it on the lowest setting and you're going to run the vacuum cleaner hose over the top of the screen on top of the quilt. So this is going to remove a lot of the debris um, and, and do a good job of cleaning the quilt without getting it wet or uh, threatening the integrity of the materials. Um, some people actually like to put uh, a form of protective covering over the hose itself. You can do this with a rubber band, a pantyhose works, another form of mesh netting. Um, so that's an extra precaution that you can take. When you move the screen, um, because you're gonna go section by section, don't slide it. Make sure that you actually pick it up and place it onto the new section. But you're gonna continue that for the front and back. Experts recommend that this should be done at least once a year, so this is an annual cleaning method that will keep your quilt in tip-top shape. So even though the uh, all over clean method with the vacuum and screen is one of the most popular, um, it's important to recognize that it's not for all quilts. So if your fabrics are incredibly fragile to the touch, this isn't gonna be a good method for you. But um, for normally fragile fabrics, it's fine. It's also a good method if you have a quilt that contains um, dyes or ink signatures that are not color fast, if you have a glaze finish on your quilt. So if you have any of these materials, uh, the all over clean method should be fine but just use your best judgment if it's really really fragile um, just avoid that screen method option three in terms of cleaning historic quilts uh, doesn't actually involve you doing anything at all other than picking up the phone for super valuable or fragile or difficult or old quilts you're going to want to use professional help there are textile or conservation services that can assist you with this um, a list is available online. It's also included in the handout that we provided for today's talk. And if you have any questions about who you should call or some recommended resources, contact the Heritage Alliance and we'll be happy to send you in the right direction. But there's um, a ton of people out there who are experts and know what they're doing. And sometimes uh, you need to call in the pros to make sure the job gets done right. Okay, option four for cleaning your historic quilt is wet cleaning. This is the riskiest option, so this really should be your last resort. And again, you're gonna wanna ask yourself, is it worth it for me to clean the quilt? Sometimes it's necessary to get uh, grease or food or other stains out of the quilt that may attract pests, but otherwise, uh, you may just wanna leave it alone. If you do decide to move forward with wet cleaning, it's important to realize that there are two options with this. The first is a water-only soak, and then the second is a detergent soak. So we're gonna cover both of those things. It's important to keep in mind too that you really need to uh, make sure that your resources are reliable if you're researching how to care for or clean a historic quilt. For instance, if you Google, how do I clean a historic quilt, several of the first uh, internet search results say it's fine to put in a washing machine, which it's not. I would bet money that this quilt behind us had actually been at some point washed inappropriately. So uh, please make sure that you're referring to um, expert resources and deferring to the, the judgment of experts. So before you wet clean, it's important to um, realize the difference between wet cleaning and washing. So when we say wet cleaning, that is done by hand instead of with the machine. And uh, 
the difference between washing and wet cleaning is that washing has some sort of agitation to it, whereas wet cleaning does not. So those are the differences between those two. Wet cleaning removes these acid byproducts in cotton and linen. So those are the quilts that are most uh, eligible for this type of approach, right? This isn't gonna work for silks or wools, so you're gonna wanna avoid that, um, uh, that approach for those particular quilts. Um, part of that is because of the actual makeup of wool and silk, but the other part is a, a lot of those materials are not color fast. And so you're gonna see bleeding uh, and a fading and a staining that occurs if you wet clean inappropriately. So again, knowing your fabrics is really important. And if you don't know, there are people that can help you with that. Um, it is recommended actually that wool and silk quilts are tended to by professionals only. So if you're thinking about wet cleaning those, go ahead and scrap that idea. But if you have a cotton or linen quilt that you're considering, then we can move forward with the wet cleaning steps. First and foremost, step one with any sort of wet clean is going to be doing a color fast check. So you're going to take a few drops of water only and apply it to the different materials on the quilt. And then you're going to use a blotting technique. If there's any sort of bleeding onto the blotter, you're going to want to abandon ship and not move forward with a wet clean. Check to make sure too that your quilt doesn't have any sort of glazed um, fabrics because a wet clean will remove the glaze from those fabrics as well. Do this with water first, and then if you are going to do a detergent soak, then test it with the water detergent combination and blot and see if there's any bleeding as well. So just do your due diligence to make sure that there's not gonna be any uh, color fastness issues with the wet clean. The main question that you wanna ask yourself is, is it more important to maintain the original integrity and finish of the quilt, or is it more important to remove the soil? That's really, that needs to be the basis of you deciding whether or not to move forward with a wet clean. And if it seems like I'm trying to deter you, I might be just a little bit, um, but I trust your judgment with this. So if you decide to move forward with the wet clean, um, you're gonna wanna take another inventory of your quilt and try to make sure that there aren't some of those other elements that may get damaged, like ink signatures, for instance. Um, dyes that appear to be unstable, that may pose a problem. Fabrics that are deteriorating, a wet clean is only gonna exacerbate that. So um, if there's any sort of degradation, you're not gonna to wanna to move forward. Uh, woolen yarns uh, are gonna be an issue as well. Or if your quilt has never been washed, there's a reason. Do not be the first person to wash that quilt. So these are some considerations to keep in mind. A lot of people think that dry cleaning is a form of professional uh, quilt care, but it's not. Uh, it can actually be very damaging because the agitation of the machines will harm the quilt, and then the solvents used can actually uh, diminish the integrity of the materials or, or flat out ruin them. So you're gonna want to avoid dry cleaning. You're also going to want to avoid spot cleaning. A lot of people think, well, I just got this small stain, let me take care of it with a spot clean, but it's really, really hard to um, get rid of that spot, and those chemicals can also be harmful and it's going to cause a discoloration in your quilt. So we want consistency above all else. So those are two things to avoid um, in terms of cleaning your historic pieces. So you've decided to wet clean. I tried to talk you out of it, but that's where we're headed. So let's try to do it the safest, most responsible way that we can. Wet cleaning uh, usually results in a very heavy quilt. So ideally, if you can have a buddy or a family member help you, that is going to be best. Because again, one person pulling and tugging is gonna cause a lot of tension. You're going to wanna use a fiber, uh, fiberglass screen underneath the quilt to support its weight. Again, it's very heavy and we wanna evenly distribute uh, the weight of that quilt. You're gonna use this screen for lifting uh, the quilt in and out of the uh, container that we're gonna use to soak and to rinse. So uh, make sure that you invest in a screen that's big enough to fit your quilt. Ideally, your quilt should be spread out in one uh, flat layer, one single layer, because those crevices can cause um, buildup or uh, not rinse thoroughly. That's not always possible, so if you do have to maneuver your quilt, please be really cautious about that. Um, it also could re require a really large piece of fiberglass screen and that's not always the most practical. So uh, be sure that your tub, if you're gonna use the bathtub, is properly cleaned. If not, you can build a separate container um, outside with two by fours and plastic, or you can invest in a tub that's a good, um, good size, but just make sure that the receptacle is clean. You're also going to want to use water that is no more than 90 to 100 degrees. Temperature is very important here, so keep that in mind as well. 
You should not use tap water also for any sort of wet cleaning um, for historic pieces. You're gonna wanna use distilled water. It doesn't have calcium and minerals uh, like tap water that may harm the quilt. So use soft water, not hard water. So those are kind of the basics of what we're gonna be doing with this wet soak, okay? So clean container, um, appropriately temperatured water, fiberglass screen, and uh, make sure that your water is soft and distilled, not hard tap water. So how much water are you gonna be using? You only wanna use enough water to barely cover the quilt, okay? So we're not gonna have um, a large body of water and then the, the quilt floating at the bottom. You're just gonna wanna barely cover the quilt with the appropriate amount of water. Um, the quilt can take about an hour or so to saturate and to become fully wet, so give it that time. If you wanna gently tamp the quilt with your hands, that's fine as long as your hands are clean. Um, the, the wet soak alone is going to remove a lot of the dirt and debris, so this may be a really effective approach. You may not even need a detergent solution. Um, it, if you're seeing the water become discolored, it means a lot of stuff is coming out of the quilt. Don't let the quilt sit in discolored water though. If you notice that the debris has started to discolor the water, rinse it and replace it. So make sure that there's clean water at all times and you're gonna do however many rinses it takes to have clean water at the end of your saturation. So those are all of the steps for doing uh, phase one of a wet clean, which is the water only soak. You should have a cleaned uh, quilt, at least cleaner than it was. To dry it, use the air dry method we talked about before. Lay plastic down, uh, a white clean sheet, and then the quilt. You can also use towels, um, non-colored towels, or a mattress pad on top to kind of sop up. Some of that, especially if you have a thick quilt. But again, avoid direct sunlight, do not hang, uh, dry flat. But hopefully that will help resolve a lot of the issues that you've had in terms of cleanliness with your piece. Next step is going to be phase two of wet cleaning, the detergent soak, the dreaded last resort. So you've tried everything else and your quilt is still filthy and you feel the need to move forward with a more in-depth clean. That's fine. You've checked all the boxes, you know that this is the right approach, the quilt is eligible, great. So what you're gonna do is use a mild uh, dishwashing detergent with minimal coloring agents or chemicals, right? Um, clear is best you're not gonna wanna ever use laundry detergents. The chemical additives are far too harsh and it's absolutely gonna damage your piece. So go with a mild dishwashing liquid detergent for your solution. You're gonna wanna use one tablespoon of that dishwashing detergent for every four gallons of water. So a very, very small ratio. In this case, a little goes a long way. Soak your quilt in the detergent and the water for about 30 minutes. And remember, at this point, you should have already done a color fast test with the liquid detergent solution. So make sure that you do that first and foremost. This is after you've already done that and everything's okay. So let it soak for about 30 minutes and then you're gonna repeat the process until the water is no longer discolored discolored. When you replace the water, make sure that you're using that distilled soft water for each rinse. You can anticipate about five to seven rinses for a normal size quilt. So that should be um, the range that you're shooting for. Those rinses should take about 15 minutes a piece. So this is going to be a half day project. Make sure that you have the time and resources set aside to do this properly because once you get started, you're going to want to complete appropriately. You can tamp down on the quilt with your fingers, or if your quilt is not too fragile and can stand it, you can use a sponge, actually. A sponge can help push the water through the quilt better than a flat hand, so uh, that is another tool that you can use for this. The final rinse of water should be absolutely free of bubbles, of detergent, of color. I mean, you're gonna want really clean, clear water, and that's gonna show that your quilt has been thoroughly rinsed. If you have detergent residue on a historic piece, it can cause further damage, especially when it dries. So this is why rinsing is so important. And then you're gonna dry uh, using the method that we've discussed before, which is a flat dry, um, plastic and a white sheet underneath, towels or mattress pad on top, several, several hours for it to appropriately uh, you know, dry out. So 
Um, make sure that you use the screen to lift the quilt, right, when it's wet so that it distributes the weight. This is why the buddy system is so important. Never hang the quilt. Do not pull from one end because the quilt is especially fragile when it's wet. Um, but if you use the screen, you should be able to uh, place it in the drying area. You can also use a fan if you like, three to four feet away. Just make sure it's not too close to the quilt and then try to rotate it every now and then so you have even distribution. That is the wet clean procedure. Hopefully if you follow these steps, it will um, go well and you'll have a beautiful, fully cleaned new quilt. Uh, if not, then you know I would re-examine the process and try to pinpoint where you went wrong. Was it a fabric selection? Was it a detergent selection? And so again, you know, try to maybe plan out in advance uh, with your checklist, with your materials, what it looks like so that you can know moving forward for your other pieces. So topic number two today is the storage of your historic quilts. So we're going to talk about the most ideal ways for you to store and preserve these uh, antique pieces. A few things before we get started. There are a couple of commandments of quilt storage, so some basics that you're going to want to do and not do. So let's cover those really quickly. First and foremost, do not store your historic quilt in a plastic container or bag. Plastic is really harmful to historic materials and will call, cause corrosion, so we're gonna opt for natural materials instead. Do not store your quilt in an area with mothballs. Obviously, this goes for any historic textile, but especially for your quilts. Do not store quilts in direct sunlight. So a lot of people have quilts on display, for instance, and with window light, the quilt receives either partial or full light. Just be mindful of the amount of direct sunlight that your quilt is receiving. It can damage and fade the materials. Do not store your quilts in cedar or hope chests. This is the little house on the prairie phenomenon where people think that um, the best or most ideal place is in these wooden trunks. It's not the case. You actually never wanna store historic quilts in cardboard, paper, or wood, or even on wooden shelves, ideally. And if you do, we'll talk about ways to kind of circumvent the issues with that, but avoid these wooden containers if you can. Store your quilts in a temperature secure environment. So avoid places like the basement, the attic, the garage. We want a stable uh, environment for the quilts in terms of temperature, humidity, pest, light, etc. Do not keep the same quilts on display for long periods of time. If they're hanging um, without being rotated or given a break, the tension and the stress can cause breakage and fractures and a redistribution of the quilt's weight. So make sure that uh, regularly, at regular intervals, you're giving your quilt a break from display or that you're rotating it around so different parts experience stress. But just keep in mind that um, these things need to be rotated fairly frequently. Do not store quilts with newspaper or in cardboard boxes. The newspaper ink is an especial threat, but uh, cardboard is also another harmful material, so please keep that in mind as well. And do not use colored tissue paper. So a lot of folks, when they use the folding storage method, um, ideally we would have some tissue paper there to help um, puff up the creases and the edges. So make sure that that is acid-free tissue paper, non-colored or white. Um, don't use color tissue paper for that because there's a, a threat of bleeding. So these are our commandments that we want to follow. Uh, obviously, people have different resources and living conditions and uh, accessibility to these options. So we're going to cover kind of uh, different ways that you can, to the best of your ability, store your historic quilt. So if you do store your quilts uh, or have to store your quilts in cardboard boxes or in wooden boxes or on wooden shelves, make sure that you line those with acid-free tissue paper or with cotton muslin, and that's gonna mitigate the effects and protect the quilt. So that is a step that you can take if those uh, are your main storage options. So the ideal way to store your quilts, option number one is flat storage, like what you see behind me. Flat storage is where your quilt lays in a single flat layer and there are no folds or creases whatsoever. Very few people have this option. If you do, that's great. One of the easy ways that you can do it is if you have a guest room or a guest bed, you can actually um, lay your historic quilts out on top of that and then remove them when guests comes, but that's kind of a form of flat storage. If you have a large boxes too, you can um, store the quilts flat like that and put um, acid-free tissue paper or cotton muslin between the quilts. Don't stack too many because of that um, weight issue that we were talking about before. You can actually flip the quilt once over if you need to. So um, 
If you do that, make sure that you've got acid-free tissue paper or cotton muslin between the two quilt pieces and uh, switch that crease pretty regularly because what you don't wanna have happen is the quilt being in storage for so long that that crease becomes permanent. So um, variate how you decide to fold your quilt if you're gonna do flat storage, but that's the ideal storage situation for a historic piece. One of the most common storage methods is the folded method. And this is okay for historic quilts uh, for the most part if you do it properly, right? So the thing that we mostly wanna avoid with any storage method is creases um, or divots or you know any sort of permanent change to the landscape of the quilt. So behind me is an example uh, of one of the quilts on exhibit at the McKinney Center that is being uh, displayed in a folded manner, right? So when you fold your historic quilt at home, you're gonna do it in thirds, basically. So lay your quilt completely out flat, and then you're going to um, take a third of the quilt and move it towards the center. Make sure that there is acid-free tissue paper or cotton muslin um, between each layer of the quilt, right? And then you're gonna use some tissue paper or the muslin to help reinforce the, the fold. Um, so that curvature, you're gonna wanna support so that it doesn't uh, cause kind of extreme uh, flattening and then you're going to take the other third and come to the middle and again make sure that those layers are protected with other materials and then you're going to fold the quilt long ways until you have a nice uh, square package right so um, we actually have more instructions about this in our complimentary handout as well as um, the quilt care videos online are a great resource for this um, the Minnesota Historical Conservation Center uh, has an excellent series. So if you have any questions about the specific methods, there are plenty of resources and we at the Heritage Alliance are happy to help you. Um, just make sure though that you are again reinforcing the creases and that you are creating a uh, space between the layers with that muslin or that tissue paper. Do not store in a box or in a plastic container. Instead, use a muslin or a cotton pillowcase or sack. That's actually ideal. So um, it's a great way to kind of keep your quilt separated but nicely contained. So that's gonna be the ideal uh, folded storage method. So at the Heritage Alliance, we store our quilts in the Jonesboro Visitor Center inside of the Jonesboro Washington County Museum. We have a collection space in the back and we actually use the rolled method of storage because of uh, space constraints. And you can do this at home too if you have the means or the space. Basically what you do is you take a cardboard tube and you wrap it in um, cotton or washed muslin or the acid-free tissue paper and you essentially roll the quilt loosely over the protected cardboard tube. Then you would take a layer of washed muslin or the uh, acid-free tissue paper and wrap the outside and you can tie it off with some um, cotton string or uh, any any sort of fastener really. Um, it's best to mark your quilts with either a tag or some signage on the tube so that you don't have to uh, unfurl it to see what it is that you're storing. Again, like any quilt and storage, you're gonna wanna take it out every now and then just to kind of uh, re-energize and revive it. Um, but make sure when you store the quilt that you don't fold it and then wrap it around the tube, okay? So you're gonna want a tube that is wide enough to accommodate whatever size quilt that you have. So rolled storage is another uh, space-saving storage solution for historic quilts, and if done properly, can help them last for a really long time. This has been our historic quilt care video. I hope that you all enjoyed it, enjoyed seeing the quilts that we have on display at the McKinney Center. I hope that it proved informative as well. If you have any questions, we're happy to help you at the Heritage Alliance. Our website is heritageall.org. We're located in Jonesboro, Tennessee. Um, and if you have any other uh, need for resources or for more information, we have provided some supplemental materials. So please check those out. And if you have a chance, don't miss the opportunity to come see our quilts in person for the Stitches and Stories exhibit. It runs through August 7th, 2020 at the McKinney Center, and we look forward to seeing you here. Take care.